Hey everybody, it's Mr. Cardell. Um, welcome. Uh, we're almost done with genetics. Uh, we are to uh, the part of genetics which a lot of kids like the best: uh, inheritance patterns. And uh, remember doing those little squares, Punnett squares in middle school. Where you had the big B and the little B and so on. Um, I, I do this last because I just feel like the the whole transcription translation flows better with chapters 12 and 13. And now we will do inheritance patterns in chapter 14 and 15, and then we'll do kind of the latest and greatest of genetics in 18. Uh, and that's it. Then we're done with the semester and then we move on to evolution. Today, we're just going to go over 14.1. I'm about to show you that. Um, you can't get away from Mendel when you do this. Uh, Mendel was the guy that figured out all this and he created a law, not a theory, um, a law. And um, there's just background information here on his experimentation and his hypotheses, he came up with four hypotheses. We know now today that he was totally right. What's crazy is that he didn't have it really any tools. Uh, he just kind of theorized and did a lot of research. Um, and then we're not going to get into any of the hard stuff or the nitty gritty until um, the next time I see you. That will be 14.2 and then probably the rest of the chapter after that. Let's start like we usually do with a movie. Your genes come from your parents, of course, and from their parents, and from their parents' parents, and, well, you get the idea. You have two sets of 23 chromosomes, one set from each parent. For almost every chromosome you inherit from your mother, you also inherit one from your father that has his versions of the same genes. Together, they form a pair of homologous chromosomes. The X and Y chromosomes, however, are special. Usually, females have two X chromosomes, while males have an X and a Y. You get one of your X chromosomes from your mother. Whether you get your father's X chromosome or his Y chromosome determines your sex. Most adult cells contain two sets of chromosomes, but sperm and egg cells have only one set of 23 chromosomes each. When the body forms sperm or egg cells, a cell divides and pairs of chromosomes separate. A random member of each pair moves into each new cell. This is why, when you were conceived, you obtained half of your mother's genes and half of your father's genes. But your siblings didn't necessarily get the same versions of your parents' genes that you did. Unless you happen to be an identical twin. To form sperm or egg cells, your chromosomes double, like so. When the homologous pairs separate, sometimes they cross over and at seemingly random points exchange DNA. This is called genetic recombination. Because your genes get shuffled during the combination, the chromosomes you pass along to your children are not exactly the same as the ones you inherited from your parents. This makes it hard to use most of your chromosomes to trace your genealogy back very far. However, most of the Y chromosome is handed down from father to son entirely intact. Likewise, in humans, DNA in the mitochondria is passed on only from mother to child. For this reason, ancestry along your father's line 
All your mother's blood is easier to trace using the Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA. We'll get to uh, tracing your genealogy in, um, in a few days. Um, but first, let's start at the beginning. I don't want to leap forward too far. Um, this title is called, uh, sorry, the title of this chapter 14 is called Mendel and the Gene Idea. He's the guy that had the idea uh, for this. Of course, he didn't know about DNA. It was 100 years before the um, structure of DNA was discovered. Um, he called them factors. Uh, he, but he knew something was given from the parents to the offspring. And in fact, this wasn't a new concept. I think probably for thousands of years, people who were breeding certain types of plants or animals knew that if they put two organisms together and had a baby, um, the baby would have the characteristics of the parent organisms. It wasn't, it wasn't a novel concept, but he was the first one to kind of slow down, and try to figure out how that all worked. Again, this is all we're gonna do is 14.1 um, today. I wanna make sure that you understand that no one cares if you know who Mendel is or you know how to do these little um, Punnett squares with the eye color, uh, which we'll do one in, which we'll do one in a second. Um, what they care is on the AP exam and on my test is that you understand how to apply these principles. Um, the principles are fine, but you have to be able to do the problems. The problems are hard. They're not in my wheelhouse at all. And so I really have to slow down and struggle through a lot of them. Um, there are some tips here uh, and on the back in the 10th edition, it's on page 290. Uh, if you ever find yourself getting stuck, I guess you could go online and have someone solve it for you. I'm sure the answer is out there to every one of these problems. Um, but there's also some tips here. So I would suggest grinding a little bit. Um, here's the tips for genetics problems. And then um, we are going to do a bunch of these questions. Uh, there are too many questions here to do all of them, but we're certainly going to do some of them. Not today, but I just want to let you know uh, it's the it's the problem solving that matters. Um, so focus on that. And I'll give you a little bit of the theory. Of course, you need to know a little bit of it, but um, for the majority, um, you just got to know how to solve these problems. So I will tell you, there was this guy named Mendel. I'll show you a picture of him in a second. And he considered becoming a teacher, but of course, it was so hard to become a teacher that he failed the necessary examination and went on to study physics and chemistry at the University of Vienna instead. That's how hard it is to teach. If anyone has, has anyone here in remote land ever taught before, it's ridiculous uh, how hard it is. I, I thought I was, I, I had it down and I still don't have it down after 20 years. Isn't that awesome? Um, which one do you think he is? Um, go ahead and press pause and put your finger on the screen. Which homie here do you think Gregor Mendel is? No. What's interesting is that he was, uh, he, he failed the necessary examination to become a teacher, so he became a substitute teacher. You never know who your substitute teacher might be. And um, then he went, uh, in order to, he didn't want to, um, he was worried about paying for everything in his life, so um, making a living. And so he became a monk for, I guess, for other reasons as well. And he um, had a vow of silence. And so for years and years, he would just do his thing. He would read, he would get up, he would pray, he would do monk-like things. And then he would go into the garden and he would work on his peas. And he took copious notes in these journals. This was 1857. And what I think fascinating is fascinating about this story is that um, he got all this data in all these journals and then he died. The journals then, were they were owned by the Abbey because all the scientific work he did was at the Abbey. So they were like, okay, we're going to stick it in our library. So they stick it in their library. And 43 years later, there's a woman and she's volunteering. She's an Austrian lady. She's volunteering. She's dusting down books in the library. And she comes across these lab manuals. She pulls them out. She wipes the dust off of them. She opens them up. And she's like, whoa, this is really interesting. And she was kind of smart. So she was trying, looking at it, trying to figure it out. But her brother was a statistician at a local university. She's like, this is kind of interesting. Maybe I should bring this to my brother and let him see what is in here. Um, and so, of course, then as the story goes, the statistician opens up the stuff. He, he spends a lot of time interpreting what's going on. And he realizes that this is like one of the greatest works of science ever, like up there with Newton and Einstein. Um, so anyway, that's, and the rest is history, but I think it's a, it's a fascinating, um, tale if, if it's all true about what happened with Gregor Mendel. So 
I think it's important if, if we go right here first and we review. Let's imagine that we are um, going to draw a Punnett square. And what a Punnett square represents are probabilities of gene combinations in offspring. Each one of these boxes, that's what it represents. And up here, what you get are different um, genes that can be given by sperm or eggs in the creation of a gene pairing for that baby. So let's imagine that we'll just do eye color. And of course, eye color is dictated by about 20 different genes. That's why you have different shades of brown or green or blue or whatever. Um, but let's just simplify it and say that if someone has an allele big B, that's going to, to that's a gene that's going to create a protein that creates a pigment that we call brown, and likewise for the little b uh, for blue. And let's imagine that dad is homozygous dominant for eye color. He has brown eyes, and in his sperm, he can only give a big B. He can give it either here or he can he can give it here. Mom, likewise. So we'll put egg right here. Let's imagine that mom has blue eyes and she has a little b, little b, because we know that blue eyes are recessive to brown eyes. We just know that. And you must have homozygous recessive genes, little b, little b, in order to have blue eyes. So let's do the Punnett square. Let's pull these genes over and across, sorry, down and across. So the question becomes, what are the genotypes of these offspring? Well, it seems to me like you have a four to zero to zero genotypic ratio. Big B, little b, this is heterozygous. Remember, hetero means different. If someone's heterosexual, they, they like someone of the different sex. And so hetero means different, homo means the same. Um, zero, there's zero homozygous recessive, and there's zero in the offspring, uh, homozygous dominant. So those are the genotypes. What about the phenotype? What's the phenotype gonna be here of these offspring? Well, it looks like it's going to be uh, this is going to be brown eyes. So you have four brown eyed children and one blue eyed children. Now let's imagine if we took one of these offspring or a, a similar offspring that had this genotypic combination of heterozygous. Let's put that here, big B, little b. And then let's imagine that this individual, so this is um, genes that exist potentially in sperm in order to create um, babies down here. Let's do the same thing for an egg. And so let's put these genes together. This is called a um, dihybrid cross, sorry, a, a monohybrid cross. Um, and the, the idea is, is that um, when we do this, we get genes coming together that give us different phenotypes. But let's go with the genotypes first. So this is going to be a one to two to one genotypic ratio. There's one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. I always like to circle this because it just draws my eye to the homozygous recessive. As far as phenotypes go here, what do we have? Well, this is gonna be brown eyes, brown eyes, brown eyes, blue eyes. So we have a three to one phenotypic ratio, three brown eyes to one blue eyes. So go ahead and press pause if you need to. Uh, this is, again, at the most basic level here. You should know all this. Um, this is just designed to be reviewed. Mendel used self-pollinating pea plants in his experiments because their flowers, unlike those of many other flowering plants, are created in such a way that flower petals completely cover each flower's sexual structures so pollen can be distributed between flowers by wind or insects. But pea plants can be cross-fertilized by hand. Mendel would carefully open the flower of the plant to be fertilized and cut off its male sexual structures so that the flower couldn't self-fertilize. Then he would carefully collect pollen from a flower belonging to a second plant with which he wished to breed the first plant and then apply this pollen to the female reproductive structures of the first flower. Mendel hypothesized that as he transferred pollen from the male reproductive structures of pea plants with white flowers to the female reproductive structures of pea plants with purple flowers, 
he was bringing together discrete physical units, one from each parent, which formed pairs that together would determine flower color in the next generation of pea plants. Mendel referred to these discrete physical units as factors. Today, we call them genes. And All right, so let's get into this. So um, first, we need to go over pea plant floral anatomy. Um, so in each pea plant, there is sperm on the stamens. The stamens are these little things. Uh, we'll get into this in chapter 38 when we talk about flower reproduction. Um, stamens are the male reproductive structures of flowers, and, and the stamens are comprised of two things, an anther and a filament. And the anther is like a stalk that holds up the filament, and that's where meiosis takes place. That's where the genes um, that are going to be in each sperm, maybe a sperm will have that big B or maybe that big B. I don't know if you could see that over there. Um, but the point is, is uh, that's where the sperm are made in the stamens. Here they are. Flowering plants also have something called the carpel. It's an egg producing region. And so the idea is that in non self fertilizing plants, um, you have pollinators like bees, which take the pollen from the stamen, they fly over to the, uh, to the next flower, they try to get nectar. And as they do so, they inadvertently brush up against the carpel and some of the pollen, which came from the stamen, which is like the sperm, gets on the carpel and then it fertilizes the egg. And then eventually you have the seed pod here. So what, what he did was he said, I'm going to be in control of this process. So he cut off the stamens, you can see with those scissors there, and he artificially, he took a paintbrush and he artificially took the pollen from other flowers that he wanted and put it on the carpel of the flowers that he wanted to put the pollen on. And so the point is he didn't let the, he didn't let the pea plants, they have like this kind of hood uh, of flowers that go over all these structures and sometimes they self-pollinate and that cherry trees do that too. And um, often that's not that great for uh, a plant because um, it's all inbred. You're not getting any genetic variation uh, by, by putting different uh, gene combinations together, but uh, they don't have to worry about pollination and um, usually it's a quicker reproductive time. So anyway, it is what it is, but he wanted to control that process. So he did. Cross-pollination fertilization between different plants can be achieved by dusting one plant with a paintbrush from with pollen from another. So that's that's how he did this. Well, he needed to find some um, plants that he knew were going to be true. And what he meant by that is um, he followed some pea plants before he started, well, I guess this was the beginning of his experimentation. He wanted some pea plants that he knew were gonna give the same characteristic every single time. He called these true breeding. When they self-pollinated, for many generations, he never saw anything different as far as, let's uh, say, flower color here. We call these now the big P, the, the parent generation, the P generation, the true breeding parent. What he then did was he took true breeding parents uh, that were contrasting as far as the characteristic he was looking for, and um, he put them together in a process called hybridization. So think about what a hybrid is. A hybrid would be like a hybrid car that does gas and electric. So here he's he's putting together white factors that he think exists in a flower with white flower color and factors um, in the reproductive gametes uh, that exists in a flower with purple color. So the idea is, is he's trying to make a hybrid here of the two. So what would you predict that he would find? You know, at, at first I would say, okay, maybe a light purple, right? He's gonna dilute out the purple color because you're putting white with purple. And what he found was, and this was fascinating to him, was that in the F1 generation, it's called the first filial generation, um, it's just the first generation of flowers that are made, all the plants had purple flowers. He scratched his head, he's like, wait a minute, did I do this right? I, I made a hybrid here and it's all purple. Hybrid offspring of the P generation, called the F1 generation. And all those plants had purple flowers. But then, like we tried to do over here with the eye color, he then took hybrids. Uh, he knew that they must have had a white factor and a purple factor, and they came together. And then he took maybe two of those guys, put their genes together to make another set of offspring. And then he found the white factor was exhibited again. And he got some white flowered plants. And he scratched his head. And he was like, well, we'll call this the F2 generation here. F2 generation is produced. He looked at many things. He looked at um, 
seed pod color and shape. He looked at seed shape and color. He looked at a height of um, the plants. He looked at flower color. He looked at, uh, I think there were seven famous um, characteristics that he looked at. Homozygous yellow seed plants are crossed with homozygous green seed plants to produce all heterozygotes, which are yellow in the F1 generation. Note that the frequency of each allele is the same, 50% in the F1 generation and 50% in the P generation. When the heterozygotes in the F1 generation are crossed, the frequency of each allele in the F2 generation remains the same. However, the F2 generation has a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio of yellow to green seeds. What's your favorite type of hybrid animal? Is it a zebra horse or a kangaroo, lion or a cow cat? Um, go ahead, press pause. Before we dive into some more detail here, make sure that you have all this vocab down and that um, you understand what Mendel did. Days, scientists know how you inherit characteristics from humans. They were able to calculate probabilities of having a specific trait for getting a genetic disease according to the information that happened in the parents and their family history. And how is this possible? To understand how traits pass from one living being to its descendants, we need to go back in time to the 19th century. The man is Gregor Mendel. Mendel was an Austrian monk and biologist who loved to work with plants. By breeding from key plants who was growing in the monastery's garden, he discovered the principles that rule heredity. For one of the most classic examples, Mendel combined a purebred yellow seed plant with a purebred green seed plant, and he got all the yellow seeds. He called the yellow color tree the dominant one because it was expressed in all the new seeds. Then he let the new yellow seeded hybrid plants self fertilize, and in this second generation, he got both yellow and green seeds, which meant that the green trait had been hidden by the dominant yellow. He called this hidden trait the recessive trait. From those results, Mendel inferred that each trait depends on a pair of factors one of them coming from the mother and the other from the father. Now we know that these factors are called alleles and represent the different variations of gene. Depending on which type of allele Mendel found in each seed, we can have what we call a homozygous gene, where both alleles are identical, and what we call a heterozygous gene, when the two alleles are different. This combination of alleles is known as genotype, and its result, being yellow or green, is called phenotype. To clearly visualize how alleles are distributed amongst descendants, we can use a diagram called the Punnett square. You just place the different alleles on both axes, and then you figure out the possible combinations. Let's look at Mendel's keys, for example. Let's write the dominant yellow allele as an uppercase one, and the recessive green allele as a lowercase one. The uppercase y always overpowers lowercase one, but the only time you get green babies is if you have two lowercase ones. In Mendel's first generation, the yellow homozygous key mom will give each pea kid a yellow dominant allele, and the green homozygous key dad will give a green recessive allele. So all the pea kids will be yellow heterogeneous. Then, in the second generation, where the two heterozygous kids marry, their babies could have any of the three possible genotypes, showing the two possible phenotypes in a three to one proportion. But even peas have a lot of characteristics. For example, besides being yellow or green, peas may be round or wrinkled. So we could have all these possible combinations we have yellow peas, we have green peas, wrinkled yellow peas, and wrinkled green peas. To calculate the proportions for each genotype and phenotype, we can use a Punnett square too. Of course, this will make it a little more complex. And lots of things are more complicated than keys, like, say, people. These days, scientists know a lot more about genetics and heredity. And there are many other ways in which some characteristics are inherited, but it all started with mental and keys. You know, I remember learning about this in college, and um, what I, I found fascinating was some people argued that Mendel fudged his data. They said there's no way that he could have gotten uh, this really nice looking three to one ratio on all of these. Um, I don't know. I was a believer uh, when it came to Mendel, um, but some people don't think that he did it right. Well, he figured, so he, he obviously, okay, so he, he observed, right? Okay, fine. Three to one ratio in the F2 generation uh, when you do these two hybrids coming together following a, a true breeding P generations for any characteristic. Great. So he found um, this observation. And then he came, his genius was that he came up with um, hypotheses to support his observation. So here are his four hypotheses. You need to know these. I would say just memorize one sentence for each of these. Here's the first one. 
that there's alternative versions of these factors or of these genes. And they're the things that account for variations in inherited characters. So um, here's the example, that a gene for flower color exists in two versions, purple or white, or over here, big B or little b. And that's going to be something that's going to give that characteristic to the next generation. There's two different versions of the gene for flower color or the gene that creates eye color. We know now that each gene resides at a specific spot. This is called a location or a locus on a specific chromosome. You can see there on the right side of the chromosome, that's where the allele for flower color exists. Uh, now, on uh, one chromosome, maybe this individual has, let's say that uh, purple flowers were dominant. So this individual has purple flowers, but they might have a gene that creates a protein that creates purple from their mom, and then a gene that creates uh, a protein that wants to create white from their dad, but then the, the, the purple gene and the protein that it creates dominates over the white. So we don't even know, just looking at the phenotype, that the individual has hetero heterozygous situation or both of the factors or, or genes here, gene variation here. Um, we wouldn't know that unless we looked maybe up at their parents. Um, this is a homologous pair of chromosomes. Maybe this is on chromosome five, let's say. These are called alleles. When you have two different forms of the same gene, um, they're called alleles. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and tell them what loci and alleles are and how they work. I like this picture from your textbook. Uh, this is just uh, kind of blowing it up and trying to help kids understand the bigger picture. So we can see there on the left side, uh, the two chromosomes we were just looking at, maybe there's a um, allele, two different alleles there for flower color. And the idea is what you need to understand is when you look at a chromosome, you're looking at all this wound up DNA, and you can see then that there's two different forms of the gene here that create flower color, but they have a little bit different spelling on their nucleotides of DNA. That's then going to each create a different protein. It's going to create a different color once you get down to the flower color. Is it cool how it works? I, I think it's fascinating. Let's keep going. So here's our homologous pair of chromosomes. Each character an organism inherits, let's say flower color or eye color, comes from two alleles. This is, a, this is his second hypothesis. We know this to be true now. I guess he was thinking, well, maybe one came from mom, one came from dad. They came together and then helped to create the characteristic, maybe flower color of the pea plants or eye color in humans, let's say. One from each pair. So the two alleles of the locus may be identical or they may, may be different. We know that now as in the F1 hybrids. I have a problem with that. Let's go to number three. If they differ, if you have this, this um, heterozygous situation, big B, little b, or big P, little b, as you can see on the screen, then one, the dominant allele will determine the organism's appearance, and the other recessive allele has no noticeable effect on appearance. You'll read in there that he actually coined the terms dominant and recessive. It's pretty genius, I think, um, when he was just dealing with factors. He had no idea what chromosomes or DNA or anything like that was. The possible combinations of sperm and egg can be used showing a Punnett square. We know how to do that. It's pretty easy. Look up Kim Possible if you need to. Sweet. Okay, here's number four. Two alleles for a heritable character separate during gamete for a formation and end up in different gametes. So here's what we're trying to say here. And this is what I tried to do with the eye color earlier. So if, if dad has um, brown eyes, you don't know what his genes are. Or if you see a purple flower, you don't know what the genes are just by looking at the phenotype. So what we can imagine is that when sperm are, and egg are made from the purple flower that you see right there on the picture on the screen, when sperm and egg are made, the genes that create either white flower, proteins that create white flowers or purple flowers are going to separate. And then um, this individual, the, the man or the, or the flower is gonna create thousands and thousands of sperm, but for each meiotic, division into four, you're going to get these divisions of these, these uh, potential genes. So in the case of meiosis, you're going to get a doubling of everything up to four genes, and then they're going to be divided out into four different sperms, the gene that creates 
the enzyme that creates flower color or eye color. And that happens on the, the side of this kind of fictitious Punnett square that you'll see imagining on this piece of paper here for the mom's stuff too, for the egg formation. See that there on the left side of the bottom Punnett square. Well, we're almost done here. He eventually then came up with two laws, and these are laws that have stood the test of time and still work today. Here they are. You got to know these two laws. The first one is, uh, well, remember, we're dealing with meiosis here. The first one is the two alleles for each gene separate during gamete formation. We just went over that. That's his fourth hypothesis. You can see where that happens here. So imagine in meiosis, um, we're going to get a doubling in the S phase of interphase of all the DNA, uh, which means each homologous chromosome is going to like give you a super chromosome, and we're going to have double a total of four of those alleles. And then when they separate in anaphase one and then again in anaphase two, in order to kind of divide down to make the sperm or the eggs, you're going to get the separation of these factors or these um, characteristics or these uh, genes that create proteins to create each of these characteristics. Um, they just separate during, during gamete formation. We know this now. Um, I don't think this is that hard. I think uh, that you know this. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, please. What do you know about how genes separate during gamete formation? Well, before we get to his second law, um, what if we have an individual with brown eyes or with a purple flower? How can we tell what their genotype is? So if an individual has a dominant phenotype, how do we find out their genotype? Well, we can do something called a test cross. And what we do then is we get a, um, we get a homo, sorry, we get a phenotypically dominant individual and we breed them with a recessive uh, individual for that characteristic. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to get fired. So we'll keep human sexuality out of this. We'll just deal with um, the plants here. If, if we have a purple flower, but we don't know what the genes are, we can breed that with a white flower and we can see what the offspring are. And if you can imagine if there are any white offspring, then the purple flower, just like the man with the brown eyes, must have had a recessive gene. It must have been heterozygous for that character, uh, for for brown eye color or for purple flower color, or else we wouldn't see any blue-eyed children or white flowers in the offspring. There's a picture of this in your book. Therefore, if any of the offspring display the recessive phenotype, blue eyes or white flowers, then the parent with the dominant phenotype must have been heterozygous for that character. Ben, turn to your neighbor and tell them what the test cross is, please. And then we just have one thing left, and then we're done. Okay. So Mendel, he had a good thing going. So he's like, you know what? I'm 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 bored. So I'm going to start to look at two characteristics. Um, let's say uh, in, for our example here, flower color and height of plant. And he said, I'm going to follow two characters at the same time. We're going to call this a dihybrid cross. Remember, hybrid means a mix. So, so in this case, he, he, found, he found plants that were true breeding. He put them together. He knew that for, for, let's say, flower color and for height, he knew then that they would be hybrids, um, heterozygous for both characteristics, flower color and height. And then he got sperm and eggs from each, and then he put them together, and he's, he's going to see what happens here in this expanded Punnett square. Crossing two true breeding parents, differing in two characters, will produce the dihybrid. In the F1 generation, heterozygous for both characters, and then he can put them together. Let's let's perform a dihybrid cross here. Um, you know, uh, I learned this in uh, at Cal Poly. Um, one of the few things I remember from Cal Poly, you know what else I remember from Cal Poly? I remember that there's a rat and separate Don't ever uh, spell it S-E-P-E-R again. And then I also learned that fluoride has the flu. All that money, and that's all I remember. Uh, I 
think I remember a few other things. Uh, so anyway, uh, here, well, here's something else I remember. I remember the double eyebrow, double smile method. So let's imagine that we're going to put, um, let's do just do the top because it's easiest. We're going to put the uh, genes for flower color and height together in sperm from dad. And we're going to add that to the eggs from mom to try to get kind of the probabilistic combinations of these genes for the offspring. So, so the way we do that is we do this double eyebrow method. So I'm going to put a big P with a big T and a big P with a small T. And then here's my double smile. This is kind of like that foiling technique in um, math that I've seen people use with, when you have parentheses. Little P, big T, little P, little T. Same for mom here. So she's going to have big P, big T, big P, little T, little P, big T, and little P, little T. Don't you wish that they used something different than P's or S's or C's? It's ridiculous. What's a big C or what's a small C? Anyway, you can then say, well, okay, what's this uh, this baby right here that's going to have um, these genes from its parents? What are these genes going to look like? Let's put them next to each other. And this individual would be purple flowered and tall, right? Well, what about this individual? Big P, big P, big P, T, little T. Well, this is purple flowered and also tall. And you could do this. I'm not going to ask you to do it right now, but I just want you to understand the concept. Maybe you want to do a couple more on your own. Let's do this one way down here. Little P, little P, little T, little T. This individual would be both white flowered and short. You can see that. And I'm going to tell you what you get in a um, cross like this is a, let me write right here, a nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio. And what that means is you're going, after you do all this and you get all the genotypes, you're going to see that nine out of the 16 combinations give you purple and tall offspring. Three will give you purple and short offspring. Three will give you short, tall and white offspring. And then one down here will give you white and short offspring. So memorize that, that uh, ratio of a nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio in a dihybrid cross. Memorize that because I'm going to show you in just a moment how that can be changed. This is the law of independent assortment. When he found this ratio, he said to himself, well, it must mean that um, genes that exist on non-homologous chromosomes will assort independently. What, what we mean by that is, let's say that you have on, on chromosome 5 flower color, like we established earlier, but on chromosome 13, you have the gene that's going to give height in a plant. And so the idea is, is, that, is that when, let me show you the picture here. So this is the law of independent assortment. But the idea is, is, is when, when everything assorts uh, and, and you, you get a sperm or an egg created, you're not going to have any of the, the genes go together. Like the, the gene for flower color and the gene for height aren't going to go together into this sperm more often than they would randomly in any sperm. Like they're not going to be linked together. And um, that's the only way that you find this. Ratio, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Strictly speaking, this law only applies to genes on different non-homologous chromosomes. You can imagine if, if the, the gene for height was also on chromosome 5, that you would find that the genes would get, um, they would get kind of inherited together into certain sperm or eggs, and you wouldn't get this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Let me give an example. Because... Um, Sometimes we have this thing called crossing over that occurs in prophase one of meiosis one. I know you know what it is. And um, you can find that genes can be linked, meaning if they're really close to one another, let's say on chromosome five, they will then go into the same sperm more often than if they were totally randomized. Some genes actually are inherited together, like freckles, blue eyes, red hair for people that... Um, have ancestors that live way up there by the Arctic Circle, maybe in Ireland, for instance. And you often see when you do a Punnett square and, and you have a, on the Punnett square freckles, yes or no, or eye color, or um, red hair, and you do one of these, you'll find that people uh, have more of those characteristics together than not together. And so um, this is called linked characteristics. When genes located on near each other on the same chromosome are inherited together, they are linked. And this is due to crossing over. They're not independently assorted. 
what then you'll see, and you'll see this in some of our problems that we do, you will see, someone will say, oh, we did a dihybrid cross, but we got a, a seven to two to five to three ratio, or whatever it is, it's not nine to three to three to one. Then you say, okay, then there must have been linkage that went on. There must be, uh, they not, may, must not be independently assorted, however you want to describe that. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and tell them what you know about the law of independent assortment when it comes to genes going into sperm and egg in order to make offspring. Well, if you need more, you can see that this is, I'm a little uncomfortable with this, um, uh, not as uh, comfortable as other things in this class. Um, Mr. Anderson has a really good video on this. Uh, you certainly can ask me for help. I'm sure I'll fumble it somehow. Um, thank you very much. And we'll get into 14.2 and beyond uh, when I see you next.